Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. In this video, I will show you five mistakes regarding Android development that I actually did in the past and uh, that, that you shouldn't do in the future. So I will help you prevent these mistakes because I have already done these. So let's actually get straight into it. Number one is actually not using view lifecycle owner in fragments for the lifecycle. So I've prepared a little little fragment here and that is an app essentially that just consists of two fragments and we can navigate from fragment one to fragment two nothing really special you can see we have a button and uh, i assigned an on click listener to navigate to the next fragment and then here we also have a flow which basically just delays for five seconds and then emits a value which we collect here in a coroutine that we launched in lifecycle scope that looks correct but it actually isn't. And that's a mistake I, I've done for a while that I did it like that. Because let's actually take a look at this app. If we relaunch this, then after five seconds, we should actually see the emission of our flow here. And it will just show this toast here saying emission. So if we take a look here and then wait for five seconds, we will see a toast that says emission. So far, so good. If we actually relaunch this, then click next without actually waiting for five seconds. Then you think, okay, the, the coroutine should actually be canceled because we use lifecycle scope. It is bound to the fragment lifecycle. So we shouldn't actually see this toast that says emission. And we don't. If we take a look, we, we don't see a toast. But if we now go back, you see we immediately see the toast. And if we now wait for five more seconds, we see another toast. So we have a duplicate emission here which is usually not what you want. Let's think about why this actually happens. So what happens if we click next here and navigate to the next fragment? Well, the fragment lifecycle of our first fragment isn't actually fully finished. But if we use lifecycle scope here and use basically this as a, as a lifecycle, so the lifecycle of the current fragment, then this will stay active when we actually navigate away so we won't collect in the in the same time but when we when we actually navigate back this will immediately fire off and that is usually not what you want what people instead want and often don't use because they don't know that is that they should use something called the view lifecycle owner so we should explicitly say view lifecycle owner dot lifecycle scope that launch when started because that now does not refer to the fragment lifecycle. Instead, it refers to the, to the view lifecycle of the fragment. So when the view is destroyed, this coroutine will be cancelled. And the view is destroyed when we actually navigate away. So let me relaunch this app using this real view lifecycle owner. Taking a look here. If we now click next without actually seeing the, the toast before. And then navigate back. We don't see a toast immediately. We have to wait five more seconds to actually see the toast and we don't, we don't get a duplicate emission here, which is, as, is, which is exactly what we want. Let's get to mistake number two that I did in the past. And that is actually not using R8 for release apps, for release builds of my app. If you don't know what R8 is, it's basically a tool that is built into, yeah, kind of Android Studio and that it helps you to optimize your app, your APK for the release build. So if you really want to publish your app, then you should use R8 because it will optimize the APK, make it a lot smaller, obfuscate the code so that reverse engineering is a lot harder and all that cool stuff. By default, however, this is not enabled. If we take a look in our build.gradle app file and scroll down to release, then we will see minify enable is set to false. If we set this to true, then by doing that, we actually enable our aid and that will obfuscate our code, make the code a lot smaller and decrease your app size. You would also like to have shrink resources set to true. That will basically eliminate unused resources, which often also can take a lot of space in your, in your final APK. And if you do that, your app, your final APK will become a lot smaller. That's often some some megabytes and that that really makes a difference and since it's not enabled by default many beginners don't use that all right let's get to mistake number three that i made in the past and that is not properly saving api keys and that's also a very common question i get 
basically yeah, how do you save API keys? How do you make sure that attackers can't get an API key that you might use in your app? In the past, I used the the most simple uh, the most simple version of storing an API key, which is just a constants file. Here we have an API key and whatever that is. However, what many beginners are not aware of is that if someone gets your APK, which is really not difficult if, if you have access to Google Play and it's uploaded there, then they can simply reverse engineer your app. So that means they, they try to take your APK and extract back the source code which you actually put into it. And then they can take the source code and read the API key. And even if you obfuscate your code with R8, which I just mentioned, so that will basically rename all your classes, files and uh, functions and stuff like that. And also variables like this one here with, with small and not understandable names, which makes it harder to find the API key, but the actual key won't be changed because of course your app needs, needs that key somehow to attach it to your network requests. So even if you enable this obfuscation, this won't secure your app from API keys. Now I'll also tell you there is no 100% secure way to save your API keys because in the end, if you put your key into your app and you upload your app to Google Play and someone gets that APK, your API key must be somewhere in that APK file because otherwise your, your app wouldn't know it. So a better way to do this is that you can uh, that you use build config to save your API key there. I won't go into the details here. It's basically a Gradle plugin that will that will make sure that it includes your API key in the final APK. This is not entirely safe either. So that can be found as well. As I said, there is no 100% secure way. Instead, if you really want to secure your API key, there are two ways how you can do that. The best on the one hand, that is just making sure to restrict your API key server side so that you you could say that only the app with your specific signature is allowed to use that API key. And if if anybody changes your app or uses the, uses the um, API key in another program, then that won't work because the signature doesn't match. However, not all APIs offer this functionality of restriction. The other option would be that you implement your own backend with your own way of authentication so that users might need to be logged in to actually use your API key and the API key would then be stored on your own server so not in your APK. That way your app can actually talk to your backend server and the backend server would then talk to the API. That would also be a pretty safe way to use that. Let's get to number four of the mistakes I've done in the past and that is using business logic in your UI layer. That is something you definitely want to avoid. So here you see a little example. I'm using Jetpack Compose here. I'm having a list and when I click on a button here, then I filter that list and filtering a list is just business logic. If you don't know what business logic is, it's, it's, it's just stuff like validating inputs, filtering a list, searching in a list, basically all, all types of logic that you would usually have in your app problem if you put this in your UI layer. So that could also be your activity or fragment, which I've done in the past, um, then that's not so optimal because then you, you mix up your UI code and your UI logic with the actual business logic. And that makes your code super messy because you don't have that strict separation of concerns that makes it super hard testable. And you also find stuff much harder. You will quickly end up with these typical God activities and God fragments, which just contain everything, your whole source code. And I'm, I'm sure you've encountered this in the past if you've done this mistake that your code will become very unreadable. The solution is very simple. You just take all of that business logic here, like filtering a list, and you do that in your view model. That's the place where business logic belongs. If you stick to clean architecture, then it does not belong in the view model. Then you would create a use case for that. In, in this case here for filtering this list and the use case would then forward the result of that to your view model which maps that to a state and provides it for your UI. And let's get to the final mistake, mistake number five that I have made in the past and that is using initials with Jetpack Compose. So what I mean with initials is that we provide initial values here as a parameter. That is something I didn't fully understand when I started learning Jetpack Compose. That's something you should do. So you see, I have a counter composable and I want to provide an initial count. So just a number at which this counter starts. 
Then I pass this initial count to my count state, which is maintained by this counter composable. And every time we click on this text, we increase the count. So what is the problem with this? The problem is that if you use that composable somewhere in your code, you have absolutely no influence on how that counter works. So you have no influence after you actually assign that initial count how the counter works because all it will do is it will increase the count and that logic is hard coded into this counter. So let's say you also want to have a button somewhere in your app where you want to reset that count to zero. That's not possible with this code right now because for that you would need to use a state that you would simply reset to zero. But if you assign the state for the initial count, it doesn't affect this code because all this initial count does is it's used to initially set the state that's maintained by this counter. So instead, what you should do is, instead of providing the initial count, you should provide the, the final count. So the counter logic of increasing it should actually be stored outside of the counter composable. And then you can say, okay, the, the actual initial count is, uh, we could say zero, zero here, but we actually want to take the state out of this composable. The composable should maintain the state. And instead, it should just have this count and display it here in the text so we can see it. What happens if we click on this count to, to increase it? Well, we also want to, to keep that flexible. So what we do is we provide a callback. So we say on counter click. And that's just a normal Kotlin Lambda function here that we can call when we actually click on that. And that way, we can actually have the logic of this counter here and this yeah just deciding what this count variable is we can have that outside of this counter composable and we can also flexibly decide what happens if we click on this counter so we we can have our own counter logic outside of this and i i think that makes sense now so those were my five mistakes that i did in the past and i hope you actually learned something from that and you maybe spotted some mistakes that you also did and that you will prevent on future. That would be cool. I would also love to know which mistakes you did in the past. So let me know down in the comments in case you actually want to learn more about Android, Kotlin and architectural style, clean code and stuff like that. For free, you really want to subscribe to my email newsletter, clicking the link down below, just entering your email address. That's it. Clicking sub subscribe. And then you will get regular tips right into your inbox on usually a weekly basis. Thanks a lot for watching. I wish you an excellent day and I'll see you back in the next video. Bye bye.